Good evening. Uh, my name is Lynn McCoon and I'm a resident of Roseville. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, I would like to welcome you all tonight, the candidates, those who have joined us at uh, Highland High School tonight, as well as those, as those viewing this forum on cable television. I'd also like to thank tonight's co-sponsors, which are the Hamlin Midway Coalition, the Highland District Council, and the Mac Groveland District Council. So thanks to them. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage citizens to participate in government. While we, as a league, do study and take stands on issues, we do not endorse or support political parties or candidates. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters, and the sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement by the League of any candidate. All candidates who filed for a seat in Minnesota Senate District 64 and Minnesota House District 64A and 64B were invited. Um, I apparently Sharon Anderson, who is running in, uh, also for the Senate seat, is unable to be here tonight due to transportation issues. We encourage our members as individuals, as we encourage each of you, to get involved in your community and the political party of your choice. It is our purpose in sponsoring candidate forums such as this to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates face-to-face -face discuss issues that are important to you. There is never enough time to cover all the issues uh, in a limited time and setting such as this. If your questions are not addressed, please, we encourage you to contact the candidates directly. And I want to remind the candidates this forum will be uh, broadcast in its entirety and will be aired and rebroadcast. And so, and all of you, please check the cable companies for additional airing times. So tonight, the agenda will be as follows. Um, each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement. I'm going to start here on my right and to the left. Um, the candidates will be asked, then asked to respond to written questions with 90 seconds per response. And I'm assuming we have a timer somewhere. There she is. <laughs> And she will be holding up a card, a yellow card, which I assume says 30 seconds, when you have 30 seconds, and um, a brilliantly colored red sign that means stop. And of course, you can finish your sentence, but we do ask that you stop. I teach, so I'm, you know, we can make you stop. Um, I'm kidding, because, you know, peace. So um, I, I will rotate the response order based on the starting order. And I will reverse directions every once in a while just so that you're not always following the same person, which sometimes makes people a little crabby. So then we'll end with the closing statement starting on my left this time. And again, we will have two minutes for each candidate. So now I would like to introduce you to the candidates uh, that are going to be participating in the forum tonight. In Minnesota Senate District 64, we have Dick Cohen and Scott Larson. For Minnesota House District 64A, we have Erin Murphy and Andrew Ojeda. And for Minnesota House District 64B, we have Brandon Carmack and Michael Paymore. And I would like to, you to direct, remind you to direct your answers to the questions, and if you need me to repeat it, I'm more than happy to do so. So we're now ready to start with the opening statements, and again, you have two minutes, and we'll start with Dick Cohen. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the League for... Uh putting this together and, and thank all of you for coming uh, to my old high school. Um, great to have everybody here. Um, in seeking re-election to the Senate, there's one overriding issue for myself. And that is that uh, if the Democrats regain the majority in the state Senate, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will do so, I will resume chairmanship of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, during the eight years that I was chairman of the committee previously, we always had a structurally balanced budget. Uh, we had a budget that worked for the entirety of the state. It was a balanced approach to how to deal with uh, Minnesota's budget problems. At the end of the day, we would have to compromise with Governor Pawlenty and, and for several years with the House Republicans. And as a consequence, it wasn't a budget to my satisfaction. I'm hoping that with a continued deficit, the expectation is we'll have a deficit of about a billion dollars or so is at the Council of Economic Advisors meeting today. And, and uh, some questions to what, uh, what is going to happen relative to, uh, to the deficit, but the expectation is we'll continue to have a deficit, that uh, I'll be in a position, uh, knowing the budget as I do, and I think it's uh, not an unfair comment, that uh, given my work on, on budget matters, I probably know the budget as well as anybody in the state, uh, with the exception of five or six people, that I'll be able to, uh, again, put together with uh, the help of the Senate, uh, with uh, the division, the Finance Division Chairman, 
a budget that once and for all works. Because whatever issue we talk about tonight, whether it be education, whether it be veterans affairs, whether it be property taxes, uh, the reality is, is that everything is derived from the state budget. Absent putting together once and for all a structurally balanced budget, nothing <laughs> else will work in the state of Minnesota. We've seen what, what has happened. Uh, the s solution last year was to borrow money, was to borrow $2.3 billion from the schools, to borrow money through the securitization of the tobacco endowment. That approach will not work. It's not working now. It's not going to work again. That's why I seek re-election is the chance to provide that leadership that I think is unique uh, in, this, in this district um, and allow Minnesota to get going in the right direction once more. Thank you. Next opening statement is Scott Larson. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Larson. Um, I want to thank the League of uh, Women Voters for having the forum and all of you for uh, coming and those of you watching uh, for taking the time out of your evening. Uh, I agree with Senator Cohen on the fact that we uh, must have a structurally balanced budget. Uh, if we do not have that structurally balanced budget, nothing else works. I mean, we agree on that. Now that's where we start to differ. When Senator Cohen starts to speak of the $2.3 billion of school shifts, um, we also have to remember that during his tenure as uh, Senate Finance Chair, uh, $1.2 billion of that was approved during those eight years. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, uh, as we came into the 2011-2012 uh, budget year, uh, biennium, uh, we were five billion projected deficit. Um, we had received from the federal government some stimulus money that was put into the general fund. Uh, it was one-time money, not expected again. So therefore, here we have a budget deficit. Again, this was passed on to the next uh, Senate Finance Chair. So when we start speaking of all of the budget balancing items, we have to take a look without question at a balanced approach. But that balanced approach must be a, a situation where uh, we take a look at how do we make the state of Minnesota competitive with our neighboring states. This is not about a wish list and then taxing. This is about competition and bringing jobs here and making sure that we produce the revenue from those jobs and those businesses in Minnesota. Uh, we do that through proper government regulations and how we structure our budget and our taxing policy and our regulatory policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next opening statement is Erin Murphy. Thank you, Linda. And uh, welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Thanks to the League for hosting this. Um, my name is Erin Murphy. I'm seeking re-election uh, to the Minnesota House of Representatives in District 64A. Uh, it would be my fourth election if uh, I'm lucky enough and honored enough to earn the votes of the people in the district. I am a registered nurse. Uh, I uh, grew up in Wisconsin, uh, went to school in Wisconsin, came here right before I got married to my husband, Joe Faust, who's with me tonight. Um, I teach at St. Kate's uh, part-time in addition to my service in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, previously to that, I was the executive director for the Minnesota Nurses Association. And in my three terms in the Minnesota House, I <coughs> found um, great joy and some frustration in the work that we've been able to accomplish on behalf of the people of Minnesota. As I said, I grew up in Wisconsin, um, and when I moved to Minnesota, I was interested in uh, a sense of purpose and pride on the part of the people here. Minnesota is different from Wisconsin culturally, and I didn't really anticipate that because we're next door neighbors. Uh, but there is a real sense of intention here about the state that we live in and the future that we uh, build for our children and for ourselves. And I didn't quite understand it at first, and I didn't quite buy it. But now that I've been here, my kids are 21. They're at the University of Minnesota. They went to school at Expo and Ramsey and Central and got a rock solid education. I do have a real appreciation for the legacy of those who came before us. And I think that legacy is impaired uh, in, the, in the work that we're doing in the Minnesota legislature. I think it's impaired by things like a new tax pledge that too many legislators have signed. I think it's impaired by uh, the Tea Party extremists that came in in the last wave election, um, promising not a penny more. Um, you can't honestly balance a budget if all you do is consider where you're going to make cuts and then use gimmicks like borrowing from schools and against future revenues to make the budget work. It's not going to prepare us for our future. It's not our legacy of Minnesota, and I am eager to be reelected um, and to work with my colleagues uh, across the state to provide for a better future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate for 64A is Andrew Ojeda. 
Hi, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, thank the league for putting it on. Um, like Linda just said, my name is Andrew Ahita. I'm running for state representative in 64A. A little bit of history about me. Both my parents actually came from Mexico, northern Mexico, and um, they came with a vision and a dream that one day they could provide a better future for their family. Um, a lot of them growing up was, you know, right on train tracks and bad neighborhoods, and the best they could really afford at the time was, you know, the back areas of Oakland, California. I grew up in California, so, you know, as far as failed budgets and whatnot, I know a thing or two about that. <laughs> And so I came here about five years ago, and uh, one of the greatest things uh, was I shared with my family is when I got the acceptance letter to go to McAllister College, which I, where I study right now. And it's been some of the greatest experiences I've had out here. I also served a two-year mission for my church, and I was very proud of the accomplishments I did out there. I went to Germany and Switzerland, so if you speak German, guten Tag, and ich freue mich gerne, dass Sie da sind. So, I'm really excited for the opportunity that I had and continue to have for the next eight or so days to, to get out and to talk to as many people as I can. The biggest thing in my life is my family and they mean so much to me. I know that everybody in here has a family that they love and care about and that's the primary issue that they got into. That's why you're here right now is because you care about your family, you care about your future. My parents cared about that for me and ensured that I would have the opportunities to progress and to grow and to be able to provide for myself one day. And I got into the political atmosphere to be able to provide that for other families, to be able to share the experiences I had and to be able to bring that to you and to represent you with dignity and honor that my parents have shown you know, to their community. I'm really excited for this opportunity to discuss a little more with you. Thank you very much. Now our next uh, Opening statement is by Brandon Carmack, who is a candidate for Minnesota House Seat 64B. Thank you, Linda, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and Holland Park High School for putting this on, and all of you for showing up. Uh, I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have tonight <coughs> with all the candidates and uh, sharing our vision for the future of Minnesota and uh, sharing where we, where we agree and where we disagree, and I look forward to those discussions. I'd like to thank uh, you, Mr. Paymar, in particular. Uh, for being here and allowing us to share our vision for 64B specifically. Uh, I think that we have a unique culture in 64B. Uh, I appreciate your service of 16 years, and I think you're a good man despite our policy differences, and I look forward to our discussion tonight. However, I do think it takes being more than a good man uh, to make a great state. I think it takes leadership. And right now, uh, when I become the next state representative for 64B, one of my first things I'm going to have to address is a $1.1 billion deficit in our budget, uh, something that we've become too comfortable with in our legislator. We cannot afford to continue the spending that we continue to go down uh, in Minnesota. If we want Minnesota to lead this nation and to be, to be an example to the rest of the voters in this country of what it means to have a solid education, to have opportunity for entrepreneurs, uh, we cannot continue to to rob opportunity uh, for, our, for our neighboring states. Um, so I look forward to our discussion tonight. Uh, I look forward to uh, bringing my vision for the leadership of Minnesota, for setting the example that, that we can be for the state. I think if we're going to uh, be a leader in this nation, we need to have leaders in St. Paul. And I look forward to bringing the discussion to the table tonight as to how we're going to make that happen. Thank you. And our next candidate for Minnesota House District 64B is Michael Paymore. Uh, thank you, and thank you to the League and to uh, the District Councils for sponsoring this event. Uh, I have deep roots in the state of Minnesota. I grew up in uh, northern Minnesota, and ex uh, except for a year I, living in Europe, I've lived in St. Paul for 23 years. And some of you remember about 40 years ago, we uh, did something quite extraordinary in the state of Minnesota. We enacted what was called the, the Minnesota Miracle. And what that was was a fair tax plan that kept property taxes down and allowed us to properly fund education. And uh, we were the envy of other states. And Democrats and Republicans came together and worked together and compromised and got that done. But over the last 10 years, things have been very different. Uh, and things have unraveled, in my opinion. 
We've had massive cuts to local government aid, a uh, billion dollars since 2003, and what's that? What's what's occurred because of that? Cuts to services and huge increases in property taxes, and people in Highland Park and Macarola know that all too well. So we can't continue with these unsustainable budgets. I think that they're counterproductive uh, to our growth, and the legislature has to agree on stable sources of income and revenue. Uh, last year, during the, the horrible standoff with the governor and the legislature, my friends on the Republican side would not agree to raise one cent of additional revenue. And what happened? <coughs> we ended up with a government shutdown. This gridlock has to end. Uh, I am known for my leadership at the Capitol. I served as the chair of the Public Safety Finance Division for four years, and I was known as someone who was inclusive and fair and passed a bipartisan bill. I have the temperament, I think, and the experience and the passion to help turn this state around. I'm asking for your support. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So we're now going to start with our um, first questions. And for this first question, again, you'll have 90 seconds. We'll start with Scott Larson. So there's several questions, and it was touched on by your opening statements, but it's a good one, so I will just start with this one. If elected, how do you plan to work with your opposition or the opposite members of the uh, State House and the opposite party and avoid gridlock as we saw this past year? As an independent, uh, I had no affiliation um, with either party, and very frankly, uh, I find at this point neither represents the way I think. And I think as I'm knocking on doors, uh, I'm finding that's the case in a lot of cases. Um, the, the working across aisles has to be accomplished by having a conversation first about what do we agree on, not what we're going to argue about. You have to be open to compromise. Uh, politics and government is the art of compromise, and we have to be talking about that. If we can't have a civil discussion, how can you possibly find a solution? And I think at this point in time, I see the political parties, and as Representative Pimar uh, very clearly stated uh, for the last 10 years, the rancor that has been there, it seems as though the political parties look at each other and want to tell all of us, uh, what's wrong with our lot in life and who's to blame for it. Uh, we can't continue this. We have to be able to have a discussion on the issues. And if we're not able to talk about taxes, uh, we have a problem. If we can't talk about uh, unfunded public pension liabilities, which is $57 billion now in the state of Minnesota, uh, we're going to have a problem. We have to deal with these issues, and you have to have a conversation. So from my standpoint, I have no allegiance playing the caucus with neither party if elected. Thank you very much. Next, Erin uh, Murphy. Thank you. Um, if you study a little bit of history, I think you'll know in American politics that we have always been divided around party. Um, and our politics has always been uh, divisive in America, sometimes more than others, you know, ebbs and flows. Um, what I am seeing in Minnesota right now and what I've observed in the years that I have worked in the legislature, both as a lobbyist for the nurses and now as an elected official, is one party, the Republican Party, moving very far to the right. Um, when I think about people like Dave Bishop, who used to serve uh, with distinction uh, from uh, the Rochester area, uh, he was uh, very clear in his perspective as a Republican. But he knew a part of his work and his obligation was to work with the Democrats. And they did. And for years, Minnesota was a model of getting things done. We've been known for that. It has been increasingly difficult to work across the aisle in, in a large sense um, in terms of solving the pernicious budget problems that we've been having um, because one party has moved so far to the right and the only way to reach a compromise is to go to their position. Individually, I have worked very hard to build good and functioning working relationships with Republicans in the House and in the Senate and those relationships are intact and they are the glue that keeps us together. And with those relationships, we can move Minnesota forward. But if you have a party that comes to the legislature having signed pledges that we will not ever raise taxes, um, it is very, very difficult to then reach a solution. And so I think Minnesotans have a job in front of them, and that is electing people who are going to be able to represent the interests of Minnesotans 
over the interests of party or ideology. Thank you. Thank Next, you. thank you, Andrew Ojeda. Um, as a Republican who goes to McAllister, I know what it's like working across the aisle. There's very few of us, and you kind of realize that you can't exist in your own little sphere. You can't get things done, you know, just as in the Capitol, you know, you, you're not going to be able to fully create a, scen a scenario where you're all by yourself or you're with, you know, your party. You can't create good policy this way. And, you know, parties, neither party has a monopoly on good ideas. And coming from the background I do with McAllister, with, you know, where I come from, I've learned this. I've learned you can't just close your ears and pretend like the other side isn't listening. And you can't also just call them names because ultimately that doesn't create an atmosphere where the party wants to work with you. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we face is that both parties will call names. Both parties will close their ears and act like they can get things done without the other party. It happens time and time again every time a new majority comes in and I don't see you know, really anybody addressing the issue. People are tired of this. People are tired of the name calling. People are tired of you know, this atmosphere of contention, really, you know, it has existed. You know, luckily we're not beating people on the Senate floor like we did during the Civil War days. But at the same time, we also need to continue and realize that we do have these deficits that we need to address. <coughs> and if we can come to the table and just realize these things that Minnesota families do hurt, then we can progress and make good policy based off of that. Thank you. Next, uh, Brandon Carmack. I agree with a lot that this one said. Uh, you know, I think Scott Larson, you hit it right on the head when you said that we need to start with where we agree. And it seems that most of us in this panel agree that the problem is the state budget. Um, that there, are, you know, one side seems to want to cut more, one side seems to want to raise more revenue. And uh, you know that, when it comes to working across party aisles, I think the best thing for the for Minnesotans is that we demonstrate some leadership in this discussion, specifically around the budget. In 2006, uh, the state budget was at $27 billion, and in 2012, we're now up to $34 billion. So I guess my question would be, um, you know, we can make the argument that Republicans have gone very far to the right, um, but we, should, we could also make the argument that they're doing what they were elected to do. This, the state is tired of the spending that is going on, and right now, we, our population, is uh, it's not very much different than Wisconsin, and uh, their budget's at 28 billion, 20, 28 or 29. And I think it's time that we start demonstrating some leadership and saying, you know what, we agree that the state budget's an issue, um, but we were elected to do our job. We need to provide some leadership. We need to do our job, do what we signed those pledges to do. We need to do what people elected us to do, and stop the spending. That doesn't mean that we have to name call. That doesn't mean that we have to not have respectful adult conversations around these issues. Uh, but I do think, as we'll find out tonight, that there's a lot of issues that don't necessarily require uh, partisan ideology or commitment uh, to make the state move forward. Thank you. Uh, Michael Paymore. Well, thank you. I, I, I think it's clear. I mean, we all love Minnesota. We all want it to grow. We all want it to prosper. And, uh, you know, I, I think one of the, uh, the accolades that I feel very special about was uh, when Representative Steve Smith, who was the chair of the Public <laughs> Safety Committee before, I was Republican, got up on the House floor on his last day and he congratulated me as being one of the few Democrats that he felt he could work with across the aisle to get things done. And uh, that meant a lot to me. He didn't have to say that. And that, I think, when Representative Murphy was talking about relationships, that's what it is about. And I think the public is tired of the name calling. Um, you know, I think about my elections here, eight of them in 64B. Uh, back when Ray Cleveland and I ran against each other a couple of times, and Emory Divoli and Andrew Smith, we always had very civil campaigns where we talked about the issues and let the voters of 64B uh, decide philosophically where they stand. That's as it should be. You know, my opponent talks about name calling. Well, actions speak lar lar uh, louder than words. Uh, in my opponent's uh, website, he called me a silent cancer. He also called me and his, uh, he also called me on his Facebook a political thug. 
Now, I don't know how you expect to get things done in St. Paul if that's the kind of behavior you're going to use in a political campaign, but it's not going to work very well. Uh, we need to have civility and proper discourse in our election as well as how we resolve our complex problems in, in St. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Dick Cohen. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, we all agree that there's the need for working together, and I, I think uh, what you need to look at is uh, who's got the history of doing that. During the time I chaired the Finance Committee, uh, Senator Denny Fredrickson from New Almeria was the ranking Republican on the Finance Committee. Denny and I would work together very closely every session uh, on the budget issues. And uh, many of the budget bills that, uh, uh, that I authored over the years, I've been a finance chairman, both division and the full committee, passed the Senate, if not by unanimous votes, very close to unanimous votes. And so that's a, a demonstration of my ability to work with the Republican minority in the state Senate when I was a chair. Um, Scott, you made a reference to uh, the 1.2 billion school shift uh, that came about during the time I was chairman of the Finance Committee. That represented the compromise, because at the end of the day, we had to sit down with Governor Plenty, and for the four years they were the majority of uh, the, the House Republicans, and reach a compromise. The bills that I authored coming out of the Senate with strong bipartisan support didn't have any school shifts in them. So I think the demonstration of whether or not you can do it is clearly what I've been able to do uh, uh, over the years I've been in the state Senate. And I think the reality, Scott, is, is that we also have to look at history. There have been legislative caucuses since the 90s. And when I say the 90s, I mean the 1790s. That's just a simple fact of American history that's not going to change. I've served with three people in the Senate who were elected as independents. Two were senior members. They spent their last term very unhappily and quit. And the last was Sheila Cascaden, who after a year joined our caucus, said it was the best thing she ever did. That is just simply the reality of the Minnesota legislature, the U.S. Congress, and the history of American politics going back to 1796. Thank you. The next question will start with um, Aaron Murphy, again, who's running for House 64A. So there's several questions um, that are kind of similar. Um, so I'm going to kind of make a hybrid, and hopefully it will sound intelligent. So Minnesota and California are the only states that borrow from schools to balance their state's budget. Um, if, if elected, what will you do in the next session to repay school <coughs> districts for the money that's uh, owed them? And Erin Murphy. Thank you for that. Uh, we are the two states that do this. And uh, as a result, school districts have to go out and borrow money and pay interest on that. Uh, so it's not an inexpensive endeavor. It's an imperfect solution. One that we've relied on, uh, not just in this cycle, but in past cycles as well. And the payback takes a while. Um, I'm, uh, when we balanced the budget in 2010, uh, we balanced the budget with a school shift embedded in it and the means to pay it back. It was put together uh, in that way so that we made a commitment to the schools before we ended that legislative session to pay them back. Uh, the current budget doesn't have that promise. And so in the next legislative session, once we understand what the size of the deficit is, we're going to have to contend with balancing the budget, closing that deficit, and putting together a plan to pay back our schools. And I'm very committed to that. Um, I think education is fundamental to our democracy. In a democracy, uh, you need to be well-educated to participate. And a democracy re relies on our engagement. So we can't step away from our commitment to public schools to make sure that they're funded adequately so our kids are getting the education that they, can, that they need to participate in the jobs of the 21st century. Um, it's priority number one for me. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Ojeda, also for House 64. Yeah. When California is the other barometer on the <laughs> radar, then it's probably not a good idea. Um, I understand this very clearly. Um, my parents still live in California, and one of the issues that comes will come up before them is will they have a tax increase to pay for the schools that they bought from? That's an issue that you know a lot of districts have to worry about here, whether or not they can pay for the money basically that they were promised by the state. I don't necessarily think it's fair, but a lot of legislators do. I think education is a vital and very important role, has an important role in our society I'm a product of a really good education system, I like to think. Um, a lot of people strive for a good education system. I do think 
we can probably come to an agreement that it's not a good idea. And I think it'd be a good opportunity to have the conversation where how do we assure that there is adequate funding for our schools? How do we make sure that you know we don't need to dip our hands into the next generation's future every single time we can't balance our balance sheets or every time our T charts don't add up? It's really not a great solution. I don't think it should have been an option, but at the same time, the money was there to pay it back towards the end of session, and it got vetoed. I, I think that is a very interesting thing. If you're talking about it's not a good idea, but let's just do it anyway. I don't think that's a good solution at all. Thank you. And so now uh, our first candidate from 64B, Brandon Carbeck. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to start thinking a little bit more long term about the stability. Uh, and you know, this all ties back to our budget. And if we want to promise our schools stability in this state, and we want to increase our uh, education performance, I think we need to start attracting more revenue into our state, uh, in addition to making cuts. And right now, Minnesota is the sixth highest, sixth highest income tax burden per capita in the United States, which means there are 44 other states that are more attractive to do business in and to earn an income in. That means that we are hemorrhaging jobs and hemorrhaging taxable revenue uh, to four states that border us. And we cannot continue to make promises to our education system uh, if, we can't, if we don't know where that funding is going to come from. So I think we need to take a little bit more of a long-term approach. We need to start thinking about how do we attract more taxable revenue into our state. And uh, I am uh, I'm very much in favor of that discussion and uh, in supporting you know, our, our local schools. I don't think that it's right. I, I'm in Highland Park, I understand. I do not want to see the burden fall on property taxpayers uh, to continue sustaining our education system. Um, but I, I think that we need to think more long term. We can't do a quick fix on this um, and answer the question in 90 seconds. Um, but I, I do think we need to start having more, <coughs> excuse me, long term view um, of this policy. Thank you. Michael Paymore. Well, I would agree with my opponent that it takes longer than 90 seconds, but let me give it a try. I do think we need to come up with, and you expect, some concrete solutions on how we're going to balance the budget. Uh, a couple of things that we might want to consider. Back in 1999 and 2000, we passed some massive income tax cuts uh, when our economy was going great guns and we had surplus after surplus. I think we should revisit some of those uh, income tax cuts, especially on the highest uh, income people. Um, who benefited most from those, from those tax breaks. Uh, another thing we might want to consider is during the biennium we have $11 billion in tax expenditures and these are basically, uh, I wouldn't say that they're, they're basically loopholes or credits that we have in the state like ethanol subsidies and programs like the Job Z program. Um, and Senator Ortman, who actually is the uh, Senate uh, uh, chair of the tax committee, she actually thought we ought to look at some of these tax expenditures. But as soon as she opened up her mouth, the Tea Party folks came around and they told her she better shut up, and she did. So there are some things that we can do if Democrats and Republicans are willing to compromise and negotiate. Um, I don't think that we need to be increasing uh, boatloads of, of revenue to make this uh, work, but we need, need to have everything on the table. We can't, we can't continue with this no new taxes pledge and expect to resolve our problems. Thank you. And Dick Cohen? Let's have some realistic talk about the state budget as opposed to some of the rhetoric. $34 billion, as Mr. Carmack uh, stated, 14 of which, $14 billion, go to the schools. Nine billion go to health and human services. That'd be the nursing home reimbursement plan, support for hospitals throughout the state, and, and so on. Um, Two point five billion of the thirty-four goes to higher education, uh, financial aid for students, uh, the University of Minnesota, the Minsky system. Approximately one point two billion is state government. So if we want to solve the bu budget deficit we expect next year by cutting state government, what we need to do is simply eliminate the entirety of state government: the courts, uh, not the courts, but the Supreme Court. Uh, all the state departments and agencies, the state capital maintenance. Um, that's what state government is, $1.2 billion of $34 billion. So if we're going to talk about a balanced approach to the state budget, keep in mind, for all the years we had deficits, and they weren't the fault of Governor Plenty or any of the politicians within Minnesota, those were national and international forces beyond our control, we basically did it with cuts. With the exception of the cigarette tax in 2005, everything was by cut. So I would suggest we look at a balanced approach. It's cuts plus its new revenue. Governor Dayton has suggested uh, taxing upper-level income taxes. 
I would also suggest looking at the cigarette tax tied into health care, um, because obviously there's a strong component of uh, cigarette smoking and, and uh, health problems. I would also suggest looking at the liquor tax, which hasn't been increased in approximately 30 years or so, because the mus misuse of alcohol and the connection to law enforcement and public safety is significant. Those would be the ways you could deal with the budget in a way that would be balanced, steady, and would actually put together a budget that would get back our AAA credit rating. Thank you. And Scott Larson. I think all of us agree that our children uh, are probably our most precious resource. And anytime you start to toy with their education, I think we all lose. Um, I remember nine years uh, during the time uh, uh, my kids were in school, uh, I was a volunteer lobbyist for my kids' school district at the legislature uh, for school funding and school policy. Uh, I remember when the first shifts came in. Uh, it's a bad idea then, it's a bad idea now. Uh, if you are promising not to cut a school budget, then don't shift it. Uh, we have approved here, which we say we're leading the nation in charter schools and in charter school concept. You have a school shift and don't give the charter schools uh, the state revenue that they're uh, supposed to get. They close. They have nothing to borrow against. And we saw a number of closures there. So we're compromising our kids. Uh, I do agree we have to take a balanced approach. I do agree that we have to take a look at different tax revenues as well as budget expense cuts. But you can't continue to take a look at where we are now without taking a look at how are we going to drive businesses to Minnesota. We need jobs, and if we increase jobs, we are going to have a natural flow of revenue. I think that that's the cornerstone of what we have to do here. The first thing the state has to do, in my view, is to take a look at its tax policy and its regulatory policy. We have to be comparative to our neighboring states. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next question is for Andrew Ojeda, and there's about 12 of them, so we might as well ask this one. What do you think? So where do you stand on the on the two uh, amendments that are proposed for the state constitution? And if they're passed, there's um, talk about that it will be expensive for the state. Where do you think uh, the money should come from to pay for their enactment? <clears throat> so I think, should I break them one at a time? Or? Uh, absolutely, well, yep. <laughs> yeah, all right, then I guess as far as the, the voter ID amendment, I think it's a pretty lofty goal to make sure that, you know, fraud doesn't occur in the smallest forms, whether or not you agree it exists or not, preventing it is also a good thing to do. And so as far as that, I don't necessarily think my position one way or the other should affect anyone else's position because I've had experiences that affected me in a certain way and I'm sure you have yours. And so, you know, I think I will vote support the voter idea amendment. As far as the marriage amendment, I do agree that it's a gross encroachment on our rights, and I do think a government that's big enough to provide, tell you who you can or cannot dictate may be a big government, but at the same time, I also have personal beliefs that have led me to believe what I believe, and that is, personally, marriage is between one man and one woman. I do support wholeheartedly creating an atmosphere where civil right, or civil unions have just as much, not power, but, you know, authority as a marriage certificate. I would like the state to move away from marriage certificates and provide an equal basis with civil unions. And I think it's appropriate to have a dis civil discussion about you know where we all come from. It's a very personal thing. I don't think I can explain to you why I come to this as much as you can explain to me why you come to that decision. As far as implementation, I can throw out an arbitrary number, and I'm sure a lot of the people on this panel will, but it's arbitrary. We really don't know until it really happens, which I don't necessarily agree with, but that's just a fact right now. Thank you. Next, Brandon Carmack, what's your position on the two uh, constitutional amendments on the ballot, and how will we pay for them thank if you. enacted? Yeah, thank you. Uh, three quick things I want to say to this. Uh, first thing is, I support the amendment process because of who it puts in charge of this decision. It takes the authority away from elected officials and removes the influence of Mr. Paymar or myself. Um, and regardless of how we think about this position, the good news is you get to vote on it. 
the good news is regardless of how you feel about it, you get to vote on it and you have just as much influence over this amendment process in this, in this issue as I do. Uh, secondly, regarding the marriage amendment, um, I think we need to be a little bit more uh, intellectual in our discussion around the marriage amendment than just the billion dollar campaign ads that we see in, in political plateaus as we start throwing at each other, like calling this a Republican extreme movement, as my opponent has said, and trying to, you know, uh, trying to constitutionalize Republican extreme opinions. Uh, when we look at the institution of marriage, when we look at the institution of the family, uh, this institution, since the time of Aristotle, uh, when he wrote his O Economica, to the development of the Pax Romana in Rome, and all the way throughout the Western development of civilization, uh, the family has always been the core unit of society. And I think that we're at the first part of um, human history of really discussing and defining. We're not prohibiting homosexual uh, behavior. We are uh, defining marriage. And secondly, just in closing, we'll click on voter ID. Uh, you know, look, it's great to see Democrats actually concerned about the cost of a program, uh, first of all. Uh, secondly, um, I would just like to say that you're going to need uh, your ID for Obamacare anyway, so hey, we're just trying to get you a jump start on the program. And uh, that's about all I have to say about voter ID. I do not want to disenfranchise your vote uh, with an unqualified vote from, uh, from a voter that's not qualified to vote. Thank you. Michael Paymar. Well, first let me address the uh, uh, voter ID uh, issue. You know, there's absolutely no evidence that we have any fraud in our electoral process in the state of Minnesota. Absolutely no evidence. And this amendment is going to uh, disenfranchise senior citizens, veterans, um, students, and uh, the estimates are is that it will cost 25 to 50 million dollars to Im implement. So talk about an unfunded mandate. You know, we got a, we've got a massive one coming right down the pike here. This is something that has been pushed in numerous states by the American Legislative Exchange Council, and it's, and it's a, it's a right-wing effort to disenfranchise voters, and I'm hoping that the voters will have enough sense to vote against this. We do not need it. Uh, the second issue relates to the uh, the marriage amendment, and I take very I take pride in the fact that I spoke uh, vociferously uh, when the De Defense of Marriage Act was first proposed uh, in St. Paul. I was one of the few members to get up on the House floor and oppose it, and we have a long history in the state of Minnesota of constitutional amendments that enhance and protect human rights, not take human rights away. And the last thing to my opponent who thinks it's a great thing to have people vote uh, on these issues, I'd like to ask anyone here, anyone here, if they if, would, would prefer that the voters of this state vote on your human rights, vote on whether you should get to marry or not. I don't think so. And I know my GLBT family and friends are, are, are appalled that this is happening uh, in, in a short week from now. Thank you. Next, Dick Cohen. I, I would say that everything Michael said and, and just add a couple of thoughts. Both amendments are terrible, terrible ideas. Uh, relative to the Marriage Amendment, when we passed the Defense of Marriage Act, which I think was in 1997, I believe, uh, and, and President Clinton signed the Federal Act. Uh, in Minnesota, I was one of 12 people on the Senate floor to vote no. And I remain very proud of the fact that I was one of only 12 people to vote no at that time. Um, and again, I would second what Michael said relative to voting on human rights. But what we have this year is something very unusual, and that's the misuse of the amendment process. Every amendment I've ever seen in the years I've been there in the legislature have passed with uh, high 50s, unanimous. There's been significant bipartisan support up until these two amendments, which underscores why these amendments are bad ideas. As far as the uh, uh, voter ID amendment is concerned, I was one of the leaders in the Senate in opposition. And all I can say is, uh, if you look at the scope of American history, it's been the extension of the franchise from group to group to group. And we have a recent history of 40 years ago, of what took place 50 years ago, what took place with the Southern Civil Rights Movement, when people lost their lives for the right to vote. On the Senate floor, I talked about the history of Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the great heroines of the Civil Rights Movement in the South, somebody who took on the Ku Klux Klan, the Mississippi sheriffs. Uh, she couldn't vote under this amendment. She was a sharecropper. Her parents were sharecroppers. Her grandparents were slaves. She didn't have the money for a car. She didn't have a photo ID. And yet she almost gave her life trying to seek the franchise. And if this amendment passes, folks in this state will have the franchise taken away. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Thank you. And now Scott Larson. 
I am not uh, in favor of constitutional amendments uh, in Bonk. Uh, the state of Minnesota has proposed 220 uh, constitutional amendments uh, over its history. We passed 120. Uh, I think that's probably too much as it is. Uh, I was not for the legacy amendment either, to which uh, uh, Senator Cohen was uh, a big proponent of. Um, I, I think that this is a precious document. Uh, we don't need to be amending this. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the photo ID amendment, we have laws. It's a felony to fraudulently vote. Let's enforce them. Uh, we don't need the amendment. Um, as far as uh, amending constitutions for uh, the uh, uh, marriage amendment, uh, we again have laws for that. In 1997, or 96 I believe it was, uh, uh, Senator Cohen is correct, he voted uh, against the marriage amendment. In 1997, the Health and Human Services Omnibus Appropriation Bill was the last time they amended Minnesota Statute 517, the marriage law, uh, and made it more restrictive. Senator Cohen voted for that bill. So the LBGTQ community uh, certainly deserves a conversation about this and to have it openly and honestly and then let the chips fall where they are. But you're elected to the legislature to pass that law or not pass it. That's where that discussion should be had, not in the ballot box. Thank you. And finally, Erin Murphy. Thank you. I'm, I'm also opposed to both amendments. I'm disappointed that uh, the majorities in the House and the Senate, I think, have used their power uh, to be able to put these onto the ballot because uh, they could. They could get around the governor and do that. I think they're both politically motivated, and I find that extremely disappointing as well. On the uh, photo ID amendment, when we debated this bill on the floor, uh, we had many, many questions about the impact of this amendment on the rights of voters who are disabled, who are students at private schools who don't have a government-issued ID, uh, on people who have, are elderly and don't have papers. I had a document with me on the floor of a woman who was born on a farm. She doesn't have a birth certificate. She had a passport, and it was, it was provided to her by a vouching system, and they had this, the letter that went to the county auditor where her sister vouched for her. That passport doesn't exist anymore. She doesn't drive. She's always been an American. She may no longer be able to vote. We can't get an answer to that question. When we debated this issue on the floor, we were not able to get answers to these questions, and yet we put this to the people. It should be sent back. It should be legislated. We should understand the answers to these questions before we put it in place. On the marriage amendment, Minnesotans weren't asking for this, and we're, we're hurting so many families. Families come in all forms. It's just not a man and a woman with <coughs> two kids. It's two women. It's one woman. It's one dad and their kids. They come in all forms, and we want them to all be strong. This is a tearing Minnesotans apart. It's tearing families apart. We should reject it. Thank you. So um, there's a number of questions about taxation and so forth. So we'll start this next question with Brandon Carmack. What is your view of a fair tax system for the state of Minnesota? Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to address one thing that my opponent said um, and that seems to be going on about the amendment issue. Uh, and I just want to address this. Uh, uh, we, we'd prefer if you answered the question that was posed to you. And you have plenty of time for that in the closing, closing? statement. Okay. okay, that's fine. Uh, so a fair tax system is one that uh, is competitive with the rest of the country and does not punish people for doing business in Minnesota. Uh, right now we have, uh, like I said, the sixth highest income tax burden per capita in the United States. And if we want to increase revenue, uh, if we want to grow jobs, I don't think in this economy when people are struggling to find jobs and struggling to make ends meet, it makes sense to sustain that level of income tax. Um, I do not think that uh, it makes any sense whatsoever to increase that level of income taxes. Uh, my opponent has continually suggested that he wants to do um, not only sustain it but grow it. Uh, we, people are struggling right now to, to continue to work, and we are going to continue to drive people away to those 44 other attractive states. We're going to continue to hemorrhage those jobs uh, to our four local states uh, if we do not make ourselves a more competitive state. Uh, Right now, the fair thing to do, the nice thing to do, and what I propose is that we extend our bottom tax rate of 5.35%, uh, expand that up to those making under $100,000. We eliminate the middle tax bracket, and we keep the top tax bracket for those making uh, individuals making over $100,000.
uh, and I could be, I'd be happy to explain that further if you want to meet with me afterward. Um, but our middle income class, our middle uh, class right now is, is suffering, and our economy is not helping them, and our legislators are not going to help them if they continue to maintain this level of taxation, um, much less try to increase it. Thank you very much. Is it Michael Paymar? Well, you know, there's a number of different taxes that we have to consider, and when you, when you think of what's progressive and what's regressive, uh, the income tax, we prided ourselves in Minnesota on having a progressive income tax, meaning uh, in that the, high, the higher income that you make, the more, uh, the, the more that you would pay. But we, what we have found, and looks at, look at the tax incidence uh, studies that have been uh, uh, produced by the Department of Revenue over the last 10 years have shown that we have we have gone full circle on that. So people in the highest end are now paying proportionally less in income taxes uh, as you are, as the middle income folks in McAllister, Groveland, and Highland Park, <coughs> and, and and that's not fair. I mean, those those are the folks that are being that are being burdened by the present tax policy. So to me, as I said in my opening statement. Uh, you know, I think that we need to revisit, you know, that income to those income tax cuts that were made in 1990 and, and 2000. And I think Governor Dayton was on the right track. Now, uh, you know, I'm sure he will come up with another bill and present it to the legislature. Maybe it won't be the fourth tier, but the income tax is really the area that we really have to look at progressivity. And let me just say one thing about regressivity, and that is what the Republican Party, and I believe my opponent wants to do, is if you don't raise any other revenue vis-a-vis -vis the, the income tax, what's gonna happen? Your property taxes are going to go up, and they have. Uh, and with the elimination of the homestead credit last year by the GOP, the cuts to LGA, what does that mean? That means that our county and our city have had to raise property taxes in order to maintain services. And Thank it's going to keep going that way. Thank you. And now, Dave Cohen. And let me follow up on that a little bit. What, what you need is, is a balanced approach, not only to how you handle budget and budget cuts, but how you handle revenue. So what I would suggest is, as I mentioned uh, the previous question, or a couple questions ago, uh, to take a look at the cigarette tax and the liquor tax. To also look, as, as I indicated, to Governor Dayton's plan to raise uh, taxes on uh, higher level incomes in the state. I know in my conversations with a number of the uh, Fortune 500 CEOs in Minnesota, uh, they talk not so much about the income tax, they talk about the corporate income tax. So we might look at that as a way to, uh, to uh, make Minnesota competitive. And that's a smaller tax. We can do that if we also take a look at something that's been suggested by every study group that's looked at uh, Minnesota's revenue system, and that is by uh, looking at an extension of the sales tax to things like services, but in the process, lowering the rate. You would enlarge the revenue base, but you would do so in a progressive way that would allow uh, middle and lower income families to pay less by way of uh, sales tax than is the case right now if you extended it to services. If you take a look at a balanced approach in terms of the utilization of cuts, if you take a look at a balanced approach in terms of what kind of revenue, what it's directed toward, I mentioned uh, cigarettes and health, liquor and public safety and law enforcement, and I forgot to mention uh, when you look at the higher level income tax, to tie that into education, to higher education and K-12, where people have succeeded because of Minnesota's education system. Then you've got that balanced approach, you would have a stable budget, a stable tax base, and Minnesota would be in a good position to continue progressing relative to our economic development. Thank you. And now Scott Larson. I agree with Senator Cohen on, on having a discussion about a balanced approach. When uh, in the last biennium, when we had the large deficit, um, Governor Dayton came out and said we should ta ta first tax the top 5% of Minnesota earners. Um, everybody thought in a transparency that that was a quarter of a million or more. I happened to call the Department of Revenue and I said, geez, what is that? And they told me it was a single filer at 83,000 and a joint filer, uh, joint filers at 125,000. That's a teacher and a cop. Now, if we think that that's rich, uh, maybe we should have a discussion about public salaries. I don't think it's rich, personally. So then it was amended to the top 2%. Well, the top 2% wouldn't fill the budget gap. So you have to have the conversation of where are you going to take this. And certainly all of these different revenue sources have to be on the table. Senator Cohen talks about uh, cigarette tax. I happen to be a smoker, I wish I wasn't. 
Uh, I was over in Wisconsin uh, the other week. It was eight dollars a pack. Well, it's five here, or five seventy. Well, we need to look at that. The liquor tax. We need to look at the income tax. But you talk about progressive and regressive taxes. Anytime you go in and you change a sales tax, it's regressive because those that least can afford it are certainly going to be the people that are going to pay that. Uh, the people that can afford it certainly can pay more. Having said that, we must remain competitive with our neighboring states or we're going to start to lose businesses. Thank you. Erin Murphy. Thank you. I um, served on the tax committee in 2009 and 2010, and there was a debate that year about extending uh, the tax treatment of cigarettes to other tobacco devices, like uh, the things that the tobacco industry is making um, that delivers tobacco but not through a cigarette, you know, little sticks and things you can put under your tongue, et cetera. And Governor Pawlenty was willing to support that policy as long as it didn't raise any revenue because he had signed that no new tax pledge. So we had to do a workaround, right, to figure out how to extend the tax policy, treating different devices that deliver tobacco, um, to treat them equally um, without raising any revenue. I thought that was absurd, really absurd. Um, and we have been stuck in that position for more than a decade. No new taxes, not a penny more. If you can't look at both sides of the ledger as you balance the budget, you're not going to get the job done fairly. Our tax code should be based on people's ability to pay. It should support the priorities that we choose, and it should reflect the economy of today and tomorrow. And we need to reform the tax code to do that, to make it effective and to make it efficient and to make it support our priorities. We've been successful here in Minnesota, not because we're constantly looking at our neighbors and saying, oh, golly gee, look what they're doing in Wisconsin, we better compete with them. That's a race to the bottom. Instead, we have been successful in Minnesota because we've provided good education for our people, because we have a strong work ethic, because we're productive, and in trade for that, people get a fair wage, and they have opportunity to climb up the economic ladder. That should be our goal of the tax policy, and that should be the goal of our budget. Thank you. And finally, Andrew Ojeda. I think the fairest tax system you could probably do is a tax system that's based on honest T-charts and balance sheets and not on arbitrary numbers or what you think might happen. Um, one of the biggest things we can do is close loopholes, making sure that there's not a situation where, you know, you can have, you're at this tax bracket, unless you do X, Y, and Z, then you're at this tax bracket. Unless you do A, B, and C, then we can put you back at this tax bracket. And then next thing you know, you know, your accountant's the one making the most money here. <laughs> and I just want to, you know, increasing taxes. I have not signed the tax pledge. And I think increasing taxes is one thing that can be you know, talked about, but are we increasing taxes than helping out our neighbors that have to leave the state because they can't afford it anymore? Should I go help them move? Should I help pack their boxes? There's entire streets where every other house is in, you just talk to them and they're hurting right now. Is that the message we want to send to them? That, hey, I really appreciate you sending your kid to a really great school. You know, maybe it's private, maybe it costs a little bit more money, but you know, we need to do this right now. We need this luxury service. So let's let's just take away, you know, the money that you had for that school and just send them somewhere else. And you'll be fine. And there's a lot of talk about the cigarette tax and the liquor tax and increasing those. California built their tax system on the cigarette tax. Their entire school system is based off that. The problem is when you increase the tax, you also disincentivize smoking. And so the big problem they're finding out is people have stopped smoking and they can no longer pay for their schools. And last thing, real quick, is uh, what you will um, say later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. She's a teacher. Uh, so, so we're going to start with Michael Paymore, but we're going to flip the direction around and come this way. Just okay. we're going in a different order. We'll, cha we'll change the tone a little bit. So Minnesota is one of the most beautiful states in the nation. I don't know. I think it's the most beautiful. But this is one of the most <laughs> other question. So what will you specifically do related to environmental policy to help keep it that way? Uh, that's a wonderful question, and I've always uh, considered myself a very strong environmentalist, uh, being endorsed by the Sierra Club and Clean Water Action, and uh, I was very proud, I'm very proud of a bill that I co-authored uh, in the House, on an issue that I feel very strongly about, although it, it doesn't necessarily relate to St. Paul, but it relates to our whole state, to our economy and our fragile environment. And that's the very possibility that we're going to start. We're going to open up copper nickel mining near the Boundary Waters Canoe area. 
Um, there's a lot of money to be made. If copper nickel mining, it's never been done in the world, it's never been done without co causing massive environmental degradation. And if we allow copper nickel mining to happen right next to the wa uh, BWCA watershed and also the Lake Superior watershed, we're going to be in deep trouble. trouble. That, uh, that environment will be in, uh, in inevitably polluted uh, for many, many generations to come. And I feel strongly about that, Bill. It's, it's not just an environmental issue. I mean, think of the people that come to the Boundary Waters Canoe area uh, uh, and who love that fragile environment. And so we need, we need to balance things out, but we can't sacrifice when it comes to the environment. I voted against Governor Dayton's uh, bill on reducing um, and weakening which, the permitting process for, uh, uh, for environmental uh, law in the state of Minnesota. I feel strongly about this. You do not compromise on the environment. Thank you. Next, Brandon Carmack. I think Minnesota has a, has a wonderful heritage, uh, preserving a uh, beautiful environment. We do, the Boundary Waters are a beautiful place. Um, our parks and our recreation areas are second to none, and uh, it's a pride of Minnesota. Uh, specifically in my backyard, we have Minnehaha Falls, and uh, we have a lot of other uh, you know, beautiful parks and in, in recreations in our area that, that I think we should be preserving because it's more than just an environment, it's a part of our heritage, and I think our funding should reflect our heritage. Uh, that being said, I think our funding should also reflect our priorities. And if our her heritage is a priority, then we should you know, our funding should reflect that. Uh, albeit, I, I do not support uh, you know environmental measures to the extent that they sacrifice jobs and sacrifice the growth of our uh, of our economy, and therefore education and programs for our schools and the taxable revenue that we could be bringing into our state. Um, my priority is on getting people back to work and uh, helping our schools and our children get the education that they need. And, um, and those are my priorities. Thank you. Andrew Ojeda. I want to bring up this issue with talking about my shoes that I have in my closet. I'm a huge, you know, bear with me for a second, but you know, <coughs> primarily I wear vegan shoes. It's a great cheaper alternative to, you know, a lot of shoes. I'm actually wearing these because they're leather, so I'm sorry, you guys, I'm not completely vegan, but anyway. It's a cheaper means to the same ends. It's a private company that happens to be out of, used to be out of California until they got driven out to the UK. And they make fabulous shoes that happen to be good for the environment. And I think a lot of private industries also care a lot about the environment. A lot of them want to make sure that you know, they're doing what they can. And I think we as individuals should be supporting groups that do such things whether you know, they care about where they put some of their waste or where they get their products. We can be conscious about that, conscious about that and making sure that we support these groups. And the biggest thing I don't want to see is making our state bankrupt on energy resources that may not be the maximum output for what we can get. We can look at other resource ener or energies and making sure that they're better for the environment at a better cost all around I you know I for all I know the energy of tomorrow is not even out there and we're wasting all our time making sure you know X Y and Z are clean while foregoing a lot of these other alter alternatives that could save us a lot of money and a lot of environmental impact thank you and Aaron Murphy thank you uh, Howard Ernstein is the former state representative from this area, and I uh, knew him and knew him well, and he used to remind me that perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think that is true in so many, in so many arenas in which we're making policy for the state of Minnesota. I, um, I really believe that we are capable of finding solutions to issues like uh, the tension between agriculture, which is a large industry in Minnesota, it's an important industry in Minnesota, and a clean environment. I know we can. Uh, we don't get it right every year. We have a lot of work to do. We should continue to pursue that, but I have a lot of faith in our capacity to do that if we share that goal. Um, and sometimes the problem that we have is we don't share the goal, right? We, we buckle under and say, well, we have to have jobs, so we just have to give in to industry or corporations and give them what they need and want in terms of subsidies or um, you know, streamlining <coughs> regulations so that they stay. Um, that's not a future thinking policy for the state of Minnesota. 
So I do think that we have the capacity to do it. Uh, we need to protect jobs. We need to grow jobs. We need to protect the environment because it's so important to Minnesota, to our culture, and to what we stand for, um, and to tourism, and to our business climate. And the last thing I'll say before you show me that red sheet is we've got to get climate change back on the agenda, that so many elected officials are turning a blind eye to the question of climate change, and we're not talking about energy in that context is a dirty shame. Thank you. Scott Morrison. Here in Minnesota, we, we, we have a natural resource that produces, according to the Department of Revenue, a call I made to, to ask them, what, what in all of the modules, income modules, revenue modules, uh, do we receive from tourism? Uh, according to them, it's about 28% of our revenue comes in through all modules from tourism. Um, that's because we have beautiful country here. So if we look at being environmentally conscious as simply an expense, I think even uh, the individual who doesn't necessarily care about being environmentally conscious is, is imprudent. This is an asset. If we start to degrade it, we start to lose revenue. So this is an asset we need to invest in. So when we talk about, and I have talked about it, being competitive with our neighboring states, we have to be competitive, yes, to bring jobs here, to bring businesses here. But we also have to remember we have to protect the assets we have. And I think it's very, very important that we take a look at that, how we operate. What Michael alluded to with the copper and nickel mining, uh, it's got to be reviewed. If it's going to degrade the asset we have, then you've got to look to another industry. And it's, I think, pretty much that simple. Thank you. And finally, Dick Cohen. You know, rhetoric is, is great, but if we're going to be serious about the environment, we've got to take some action. Um, every campaign I run, I've had the endorsement of the Sierra Club and Clean Water Action, as they do in this campaign, and I'm very proud of that. And I think it's because of what I've done as a state legislator. I authored the bill, uh, the Environmental Crimes Bill, that made it a crime to intentionally pollute uh, the environment. And that's been used by county attorneys around the state. Uh, Mr. Larson offered some criticism of the Legacy Amendment. The centerpiece of that amendment and the amendment was put together in the Finance Committee under my chairmanship, was the clean water part of that amendment. And the reality was is that Minnesota's lakes and rivers uh, were going to take 125 to 135 years to clean up, given the revenues that were available to undertake those kinds of efforts. So if we talk about the utilization of the environment, everybody's love of the environment, and how much fun we have in the environment, the reality is, is we were going to lose the environment, absent something significant. And the Legacy Amendment did that by making sure that there were revenue streams to significantly reduce the pollution of rivers and lakes, as well as provide clean water. Um, lastly, um, although I've not been involved in a lot of the environmental issues, as chairman of the Finance Committee, I made sure the Environment uh, Finance Division had the resources necessary to allow Minnesota to move forward in terms of utilization of green energy. And I worked with uh, the former chairman, Senator Alan Anderson, who's left the Senate, to make sure that we had um, a budget that would reflect Minnesota's progress in terms of utilization of new energy sources. And would agree with uh, Representative Murphy that we need to get back to those discussions, get back to doing something about climate change. That's the next uh, challenge for the state legislature in terms of the environment. Thank you very much. This next station sec uh, question starts with Brandon Carmack. Do you uh, support continued development of mass transit? I think that the mass transit system that we have right now uh, could definitely be improved. And um, I think buses have served greatly, have, have done a great job of serving our district and helping people get to jobs when they are really struggling with trying to get from point A to point B. I think the discussion that we need to start having is around the idea of light rail. Um, I'm not sure of many businesses that invest in a state because it has a fancy train that goes from point A to point B back and forth. Um, as a matter of fact, I know of a lot of businesses in University Avenue that were very, that are very much affected by the light rail system that's been put in front of their, uh, in front of their businesses. Those are potential growth opportunities, potential jobs for people in my neighborhood. And um, when I go out door knocking and people are trying to find work and they would give anything to be able to work at one of those businesses, um, and this train is coming through and preventing any type of commerce from coming to those businesses, um, I think that's a sad state of our state. Uh, when those businesses are on the capital steps, knocking on doors, asking to get this thing out of our front yard, I think uh, it's the obligation of the leader of that district uh, to come out and say, let's, let's have a discussion on this issue. 
Uh, so no, it's costing us $40 billion a year. Um, I think that, that buses are, are much more effective, and, uh, and I look forward to having a discussion on that as a potential way we can save some money for our state. Thank you. Andrew Ojeda. <clears throat> as far as continued development of mass transit, I have no problem continuing the development of mass transit. The problem I have is who fronts the bill and who has to pay for these things. I mean, tax and taxes and balance sheets are one thing, but an individual's well-being and their livelihood are really at stake here because, like Brandon said, there were individuals at in the are on the Capitol steps arguing, saying that they it will cost them their, <coughs> their job, it will cost them their business, and a lot of businesses had to just close their doors. And if you're lucky, if you're a Burger King, then you could totally just shut down and not worry about it. You can continue paying your lease, but you're financially set to be able to weather the storm. But if you're a small mom and pa shop that's first or second generation in most cases, that want to provide a valuable <coughs> asset to the community, just a great location to eat, then you're saying, well, we don't necessarily agree with you. It's going to provide other people jobs. So just calm down and find something else to do. I don't agree that that should be the policy of anybody. And that has been the problem with these the light rail system. I lived in Europe for a significant amount of time. I take buses here all the time. I took the bus at the Capitol every time I went to the Capitol. It's a great system. I think you know it can definitely be improved, especially with the cold weather and whatnot, and having to wait sometimes. It can be difficult, but I definitely think we should rethink who has to pay, not just for the taxpayer, who will probably never use it, but also the individual whose livelihood is at stake. Thank you. Erin Murphy. Well, I, I do support the expansion of uh, mass transit. I think it's critical to the region and for our future. And once again, this is a question of today versus tomorrow. Um, I think the use of mass transit and expansion of mass transit is going to contribute to a cleaner environment in Minnesota. I think it's going to contribute to our health. Um, and I think it's going to spur business growth. And yes, when the, the train is being laid down, when the tracks are being laid down on University Avenue, some businesses are struggling, some businesses are thriving. University Avenue is a different place now than it was 10 years ago. It's, it's going to change. And some of that is because of light rail and the development, and some of it is because of the economy and the recession. Um, I think that the city and the state have done a good job of trying to mitigate those issues, but not everybody's going to survive. That is the way that works. But I think for our future, we need to be able to figure out how people are going to be able to move, um, how businesses are going to thrive, and light rail is a, a critical component to that. Thank you. Scott Larson. I think the discussion of whether we should have light rail or not is uh, pretty much over. We have it. Uh, I think now we need to have the conversation of let's make sure that the rail lines don't dead end anywhere. Uh, right now we have a very uh, uh, good opportunity uh, in the fact that uh, in the uh, tragedy of the Ford plant closing, there is a BNSF uh, rail spur there that dead ends on the Ford plant. Uh, can be acquired very uh, cheaply as that goes in, in large dollars. But it goes down to the depot. From the end of that rail spur, it's three miles to the Hiawatha line. Uh, it's something we ought to be considering and considering now. That gives St. Paul something nobody else has in the state, Minneapolis included. Uh, a loop through our city. That drives businesses here. Uh, it gives us a solid multimodal transportation system that makes sense. Uh, the light rail is here. Well, let's now finish the job and let's make sure that it creates jobs as we're building it. Let's plan it well and let's make sure that there's a good hub and spoke feeder system with the good bus transportation that we have. And I think we can do it cheaply. I think we can do it efficiently. And I think it gives St. Paul something that is very positive. Thank you. Dick Cohen. The issue of light rail is, is not in it because obviously uh, with completion of the Central Corridor, that's uh, only the second line. Um, I had a discussion uh, several years ago with the former CEO of General Mills, and what he told me is that they gave serious consideration when hiring to not hiring somebody from the East Metro area because they were concerned that that person could not make his or her way through three traffic jams get, to get to work uh, in uh, Western Hennepin County at General Mills. And that underscores why we need to have a continuance 
of putting together uh, a significant mass transit and mass transportation system. It's been a real, I, I think the legislature has done uh, a variety of things over the years. I think one of the places where uh, the governor, and this started to be in all honesty with Governor Purvich uh, and the legislature, uh, lost the sight of what needed to be done was our delay in implementation of a strong mass transit system. Uh, I certainly think we should provide more support for the businesses on University Avenue. And I'm not talking about myself. My law office is on one of the renovated buildings on the western end of University. But uh, we've been not impacted by the construction. But I see what, what it can do. Uh, I certainly think that uh, absent the Central Corridor, uh, St. Paul would be that much more of an economic island uh, opposite Minneapolis. Uh, but we need to continue uh, the mass transit lines, the Southwest Corridor. Uh, we need to have a system that's going to look like many of the other metropolitan areas um, around uh, the country because the absence of that strong uh, mass transit system uh, is a true driver of economic development. We need it to continue job growth. Talk to any major CEO in the Twin Cities area. Thank you. And finally, Michael Paymar. Well, we have to think about not just today, but also the future. And uh, the demographics are this, that uh, the metro area is going to con continue to increase in population. There is no doubt about that. And we already can see the gridlock on our, on our freeways, our highways, and our roads. Uh, and right here in St. Paul, um, I remember on the House floor when the Hiawatha Corridor was being proposed and some of my friends on the other side of the aisle, the anti-transit folks, got up and, and talked about how this was the biggest waste of money, the biggest taxpayer boondoggle, <coughs> nobody's ever going to ride it, and it's going to cost us a fortune. Well, the fact of the matter was, is, is the Hiawatha Corridor, even though I, I would have done some things differently, has been an incredible success. Uh, it hasn't provided the kind of economic development that the Central Corridor will along the corridor, but it has been a tremendous amount of success with the, with the kind of ridership that's occurring. Now, I, I, my heart goes out to the small business people. I was a small business person. I, my heart goes out to some of those folks on, on University Avenue that have suffered through this. But as Representative Murphy said, that whole area is going to be transformed in 2014 upon completion of that, of that corridor totally transformed. You can already see it happening. And we have another corridor that's on the, that's on the books right now. Federal money is available for the Southwest Corridor. Uh, so we need a multimodal system that's a commuter rail, light rail transit, a good bus system, uh, and we can do it. We have, and, but we have to do it now. Thank you. This next question will start with Andrew Ojeda. And there's a number of questions about the budget. So what would be your top three priorities when making funding decisions in a budget year? I think that my top three priorities would be balance sheets, tea charts, and families, because those are three things that you need to look at when you're balancing a budget. You need to make sure that you know it's fair for everybody. You need to make sure that, one thing, you're not pulling numbers out of thin air. And another thing, you need to make sure that families are OK and not hurt. Part of the, you know, part of the budget, making sure that it's coherent is, you know, there are taxes that do happen. Um, I'm going to reference back to a tax that we had talked about a little earlier about the uh, liquor tax, if I may. You know, the the thing that drives college kids most to the liquor stores is knowing that they get to pay those extra tax burdens that the state decided to fund it with. <laughs> if you tax it through the roof, people are going to stop using it. And I think that's the problem that you see. You cannot continue to rely on policies that don't work. And I think that is really the problem here is that state after state has already proven that using sin taxes isn't a way of getting actual revenue. It can't balance your T-chart because it will continue changing. It. The more you increase it, the less likely someone's going to use it. I think if we have to sit down and talk about what's best for our families, what's best for everybody, we can come to a T-chart, you know, t oops, sorry, the standard, you know, basic accounting where it works for everybody. You can look at it and say, these are all the numbers, and you can be confident that it will work through as long as you'd like it to work. Thank you. So again, what are your top three priorities when making funding decisions at Erin Murphy? Thank you for the question. <coughs> You know, I think we're going to have a very hard job in front of us uh, in the next couple of years with Governor Dayton. 
We have to balance the budget honestly and in a, in a sustainable way, and we have to prepare and move our state and our people toward the future. <coughs> and that's a, that's a tall order in a two-year budget cycle. Um, I think to do that, we have to make sure we are funding adequately our schools, early, at, early childhood all the way through higher ed. Um, higher ed costs are really becoming a burden for middle class families. I know I've got two kids in college. It's, it's substantial at the University of Minnesota. Um, and if we want to have a bright future, we need to have properly educated um, students and people. So priority one is their schools. We have to continue to slow the growth in health care, and I think we can do that by implementing the Affordable Care Act here in Minnesota. It's been a frustration of mine that we've been so stuck. It's so unlike Minnesota to be stuck on health policy, but here we've been for two years waiting. Uh, this is the outcome of this election. And then finally, I think we have to restore our commitment to local units of government with local government aid and county property uh, aid so that we take pressure off uh, local property taxes, both for small businesses and farmers and for families across the state of Minnesota. We've been relying by, uh, by the budget cutting that we've been doing in Minnesota, we've been shifting uh, taxes onto property taxpayers all the way across Minnesota, not just in the metro area, but everywhere. And people are really feeling that pain, and we can't continue to do that. So that would be my third priority. Thank you, and uh, Scott Lewis. I think that it's necessary when you take a look at the budget uh, that, uh, again, you can't put the wish list down and say, okay, now we're going to tax for that. Um, we do have to maintain our schools. That's constitutionally mandated. Uh, we can't continue to shift uh, money away from them. Uh, that just doesn't work. Uh, now, if you say we have a constitutional mandate to balance our budget, uh, we have $2.3 billion that we borrowed from schools. Uh, we took a revenue stream uh, of tobacco money and borrowed $750 million, and we're now going to use that revenue steam stream for 20 years to pay that back. We use that as one-time money. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, you have to take a look at uh, a, a, an expense priority. Uh, schools, we must fund. Uh, do we need to fund each and every item that's there? Well, that's a discussion. But I do think that we need to fund what we promised. I think that's important. Our health policy, uh, now we have a change coming about with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we will see if that does, in fact, save money. Um, uh, <coughs> certainly, uh, between health policy, health costs, and schools, that's the two largest bu budget items we have in the state. So those are priorities we take. But every time that we shift, we now move the tax burden down. It goes down to the county, then down to the cities, and guess who pays? We do in our property tax. So as a consequence, we also have to balance that policy like we have uh, the state legislature determined to do so with schools and cap them. We need to do the same thing with the counties and the city. Thank you. And Dick Cohen. I'm glad Mr. Larson mentioned the securitization of the tobacco endowment, which I oppose because that, that was just one of the truly bad ideas that I saw in last year's session. Both of the budget priorities, however, let me raise a, a couple of issues. Uh, Aaron mentioned one, but in the education budget, the University of Minnesota, in a mid-sized state like Minnesota, the most significant institution, public or private, is the land-grant university. We have turned the University of Minnesota into a quasi-private school. Um, and we need to start to turn that around. We made the University of Minnesota, which when I was in high school here at Highland, well, I had the chance to go to a private school out of state. Um, the University of Minnesota was an affordable, accessible, high quality school for the kids throughout the state. We have gotten away from that. We've gotten more to a University of Michigan model. We have to rebuild the University of Minnesota, both in terms of its education component and to continue the, uh, the research component of, of the university. Second, early childhood. The connection between uh, what happens with uh, a child who has access to early childhood and where that child is uh, as that person reaches uh, junior high and senior high is significant. We need to expand that budget. Uh, we've talked about the Affordable Health Care Act and the need for implementation. And I would also uh, follow up on what Aaron mentioned about LGA. When the Minnesota Miracle was passed in the early 70s, the state became a partner with the local governments in terms of providing support to cities, particularly the urban centers like St. Paul and Minneapolis, which are more impacted by what happens within the state. We need to get back to a shared partnership with the state to not only keep down property taxes, but allow the cities to run more efficiently. Thank you. Michael Paymar. 
Let me first say that I, uh, I, I don't think anybody wants to see waste and inefficiency in government. When I was a committee chair, uh, we spent hours and days and days with fiscal staff looking at the departments that were under the purview of, the, of our committee, the courts, the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Corrections, and we, and we made efficiencies, found out that uh, in the Department of Corrections, a lot of employees were able to take state cars home. We cut that car fleet in half. Uh, you know, we're, nobody wants to see waste in government. Uh, but we have to think about the future, and when I think about the priorities for the future, uh, I, I remember Tom Stinson, who's the state economist, said to uh, said to us a couple of years ago, as we were as we were moving into this horrible recession, he said the best thing that government can do is invest in education at every level, early education, K twelve, higher education. That should be where our investment is. That is, education uh, is the economic engine of this state, and we've been failing that miserably. The second thing is infrastructure. We had a bridge fall down in Minneapolis. That shouldn't happen. We need to be able to tell our businesses and people, businesses coming here, that you can get your goods from point A to point B, and you can't do that when your roads and your bridges are falling down. And the final thing is, when I'm thinking about the budget, as I said earlier, it has to be fair. It has to be fair to the citizens of the state of Minnesota. And you know in Highland Park and Mack Groveland, the system is not being, is not fair with the increases in property taxes. Thank you. And finally, Brandon Carmack. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I think that, you know, the first way we should describe our state budget is that it's responsible. Um, more so than uh, necessarily fair, I think responsible is a better word because uh, responsibility in our budget shows that we have the ability to fund the programs that we promise we're going to fund. Uh, right now, we can't do that. We have a $1.1 billion deficit that's facing us in the next two years, and it's great to say that we should fund education. It's great to say that we want to fund uh, environmental policies. It's great to say that we want to fund the light rail system. But at the end of the day, responsibility says there's a, there comes a point where we have to demonstrate some responsibility and stability in our state um, if we want to lead this country in economic growth and in education uh, improvement. Uh, second thing, I, I think it needs to be pro-growth. I think it needs to incentivize uh, and be competitive among the states. I think that uh, part of the budget is the income stream. And uh, we, in order to get more income into the state, we need to demonstrate uh, that we don't necessarily want to take more money of your, away, more of your money away. Um, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, for spending to go up as much as it has, and then for the government to come back and say that we're sorry we can't get our budget in order, but we want to tax you more, we want to continue taking more of your money, I think is irresponsible, it's not pro-growth. And uh, finally, um, you know, education it is, a, it is a big focus of mine. Um, I come from a school that receives zero uh, fe federal or state funding, and yet has a 94 placement rate, 94% um, placement rate. And uh, I think there are ways to continue growing our economy and continue helping our education. I think it's a cheap way to just say we're going to continue funding them uh, just to make them better. There's better solutions if we want to actually have a, a more responsible budget. Thank you. So with the next question, we'll start with Erin Murphy. So uh, many people have been uh, noticing that camp political campaigns have been getting uglier and that a great deal of money is coming in on certain races from outside the state of Minnesota. So do you favor campaign reform and what would you like to see done? Well, I will tell you that uh, uh, I, I've had the good fortune of um, knocking across 64A and then spending time in other parts of the state uh, this cycle as I've worked to recruit candidates and work to get them elected. And Minnesotans across the state are really, really frustrated, first by the gridlock, right, and the government shutdown and uh, sort of the tone that came out of this Minnesota legislature in the last couple of years. Uh, but they're also really growing weary of um, the political discourse that they're seeing. And there's been a lot of uh, negative campaigning happening, not so much in our district, but in districts where um, the races are very, very competitive in some of the suburban and greater Minnesota districts. And I think even tonight, as you listen to us, there are plenty of ideas and issues over which we disagree honestly. And there really isn't that much call for or need to disagree dishonestly, because there's plenty to disagree about honestly. Um, and I think Minnesotans, right, they're getting frustrated by that. The grainy pictures and the, the, you know, the misleading statements. And I want to give a shout out to Brandon tonight because he is continuing to uh, be clear with us that there is a $1.1 billion deficit that we face. There are a lot of candidates running in Minnesota 
that are saying that uh, the balance, the budget was balanced, right? We budget, we had a five billion dollar deficit, and now we've got a balanced budget, and there's no deficit in the future. That's dishonest. Um, we don't need to do that. We've got real problems that we need to solve, um, and we should start on a level playing field. So I think that uh, you know there are solutions. Um, we're going to have to do some reform, especially around uh, Citizens United and transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Larson. I think these campaigns have gotten to uh, a fever pitch of rancor in many cases. Uh, I think it started with a Willie Horton ad back in, what was it, 92. Um, prior to this campaign, when I decided to run, I wrote uh, Senator Cohen a letter and said, geez, would you like to get together and have a cup of coffee? And he kindly called and we sat down at the St. Clair Broiler and talked about why he likes the arts. And, why I like what I do, and had a nice conversation, and, and essentially made the statement that the campaign will be about the issues, not the fact that he might uh, I might go out and say he's got horns coming out of his head, and he goes out and says I got buck teeth, uh, and we kept it that way. Uh, and I and I thank Sarah Cohen for that. I, I think that that's where campaigns need to be. Um, we don't need to be finger pointing. We don't need to be talking. Uh, about uh, personal issues or anything else, let's talk about the issues, and let's do it honestly. Um, I think in Minnesota, we're fortunate. We have good uh, campaign finance laws. I think uh, our feet are held to the fire, uh, and I think we just need to simply um, uh, be uh, respectful. A little golden rule uh, goes a long way, and again, I want to thank Senator Cohen for uh, the way he's conducted his campaign, and I hope he feels the same about the way I've done mine. Thank you. Scott Larson. I mean, uh, Dick Cohen. <laughs> Sorry. And I, I would agree with Scott that, that uh, we've, we've tried to conduct this campaign based, based on issues. Um, the thing that has, has been most distressing about campaign finance, obviously, is the Citizens United case. And we're running for state office. We don't have the opportunity to uh, try to affect change at a federal level relative to that. But, but if people are distressed by campaigns this year, I think it's a direct uh, connection to the Supreme Court's decision of three years ago relative uh, to Citizens United. Um, in this state, we do have a decent system. We have a system of public finance for campaigns. We have uh, spending limits. We have some significant contributor limits. I was on the conference committee um, a number of years ago that, that set up many of those limitations. And I think as a consequence, you need to draw the distinction between legislative races, state legislative races, and federal congressional races. <clears throat> you know, if you look at the, you know, the ads uh, that we see in the Twin Cities on, say, the uh, Nolan Cravac race, you know, that's a direct uh, connection to the consequence of, of Citizens United. But I think in the legislative races, you don't see those kinds of, um, uh, old, I won't say outliers, but because <coughs> that would be incorrect, but you don't see those kinds of, of uh, campaigns being, being waged. I think if you look at legislative races, not just in this district, but in many of the districts, there's a, a more reasonable approach. Uh, like Aaron, I've done some campaigning around the state, uh, certainly in, in districts that uh, you have candidates maybe a little bit more at each other's throat, um, you have a touch of that, but nowhere near to what we're seeing at a federal level. Um, Thank you. I do think we need Thank more you. transparency, though, relative to uh, Thank you. the state level. Thank you. Michael Paymore. Well, I, you know, I just feel like I've had a, a long history um, in running for campaigns and always running a, a fair uh, campaign and, and not name-calling and and having a decent dialogue uh, and discussion with my opponent, whether it's at forums like this or uh, door knocking or other forums, and, and I will continue, I'll, I'll continue with that behavior because I think that's what people in, in this district expected me. Uh, it you know it it doesn't it doesn't make me um, you know the hit pieces that are going around, and this is on the state level too. Uh, you know I think it really cheapens the whole electoral process. You know, so, you know, when, when we mislead about someone's votes uh, or even their personal character. And I, I've always found that uh, an element of campaigning that I've disdained. Uh, to be frank, I wished we had a system more like in, uh, in Great Britain and some of the Euro our European neighbors where we shortened the electoral, uh, the whole election process. I mean, for God's sakes, when they, after November 6th, we're going to start all over again. You watch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what you see when you have a party saying, all we're going to do is spend the next four years making sure that the people in power, uh, you know, don't get anything done. Then we're not going to get anything done. 
And I think we're better than that. But, you know, people have to start uh, making a noise about this and telling their elected officials that they don't want this kind of campaigning. Thank you. Brandon Carnack. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican in 64B, so I've, I've heard all the attacks, and uh, my name sounds a lot like Chip Kravax, so uh, I turn on the TV, and I feel like I'm getting yelled at every time I turn on the TV, and I go go knocking on doors, and people say, I don't want to hear about Chip. I'm not Chip. I'm Brandon. And, uh, and I think it's important for all of us to know. You know, this Michael Paymar is... It's not Barack Obama. Brandon Carmack is not Mitt Romney. And how uh, our how our parties conduct themselves on a national stage, uh, that's, the, that's at the level of the national stage. We're, we are neighbors. And uh, we have uh, a lot of issues pressing right here at home that, like I said at the beginning, don't necessarily uh, necessitate uh, some type of name-calling or political extremism um, because I think our issues are different here. And uh, as a neighborhood, I think we need to work together to find those solutions and uh, to discuss, you know, one thing that I've committed to, um, if elected, is working with whoever the Senate candidate is and whoever the 64A candidate is um, on a weekly basis that we get together uh, in the legislature and say, what's going on in our district? And let's just talk about it. Uh, and it, I don't care what party you are, I don't care you know, where you're from, let's get together once a week, let's make it a priority because we have that obligation to the people of our district. And, um, and that's how we're going to continue to lead in the legislature, and, how, and that's how we've led our campaign. Thank you. And finally, Andrew, Andrew Ojeda. Yeah, it's something I've you know, come to really appreciate. You know, my church taught me really well that um, you can't build yourself up by tearing someone down. That's something that it's a very personal issue. You, know, you believe you can run a campaign smearing other people. That's your prerogative. A lot of people don't like it. If, you know, if you believe your issues are more important, then you can run on the issues. And I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity I had and continue to have the next few weeks, or next week or so, that to run a really great campaign. I'm really proud of what I've done. I'm really proud of everybody I've met. There's been very few doors slammed in my face, and only one time did I think I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so it's, it's been a rather great experience, though. And... No, I'm mildly used to it. You don't go to Germany and Switzerland preaching the gospel and assuming that you're going to have a welcome reception at every single door. Um, but it's been a really great experience. As far as you know, campaign finance reform, Minnesota has done a really great job making sure that I can't buy cigars for my staff on election night and making sure that you know everyone's accountable for what they've done. Um, I wouldn't buy cigars for my campaign staff on election night, so <laughs> just FYI, but I'm glad the option's close to me anyway. And so it's just been a wonderful experience to have the opportunity to meet so many great people who want to know about the issues, who want to know, you know, the perspective I bring. They wholeheartedly believe what I believe in, and I'm really great to have the opportunity to possibly represent them. Thank you very much. So I got a card saying I have to stop, and I saved my favorite question for last, so I'm, I'm sad. Um, so we'll now have to, I'm told we have to begin our closing statements, and so we'll go in the reverse order that we started with, and so we'll start, then you have two minutes for your closing statement, and we'll start with Michael Paymore. Well, again, uh, thanks, to the, th thanks to the league and all the folks that came out tonight, I hope that, uh, that this discussion was, was helpful. Uh, I do want to say to my opponent, I'm glad he's... Uh, uh, changed his tune. I hope he takes some of the words that he's put on his uh, Facebook account, calling me a political thug and a silent cancer off his Facebook account. That would be nice. Um, I, I think that candidates and political parties um, should maintain their principles, but ultimately we have to be able to negotiate and compromise. And I have a proven record at the Capitol. I was the chief author of the most comprehensive public safety bill in history. And not just funding the courts and the Department of Corrections and the Department of Public Safety, but being smart in fighting crime. Uh, we funded intervention and prevention programs to help stop young people from going to prison. <coughs> and I've not been afraid to stand up to the NRA and advocate for meaningful gun control as the capital. I've been a leader in defending the Freedom to Breathe Act, <coughs> getting tobacco out of our restaurants and bars. And I've been a leader on educate, making education a priority, building a stronger economy, 
and advancing human rights in the state. I was proud to be Governor Dayton's uh, chief author of his omnibus tax bill uh, last year. I, I hope to, to be part of solving our current uh, budget problems because they are going to be difficult next year. So if I am reelected and you return me to the legislature, I'll continue my long history of being accessible to the community. I think that uh, some of you may know because you've joined me at my constituent meetings that I hold uh, Saturday morning uh, constituent meetings at the Hillcrest Recreation Center where we talk pretty much about everything and anything. And, um, and I hope also to be a lead architect in a state city uh, relationship to redevelop the Ford plant site properly and to maintain the funding for local government aid and lower property taxes in our state. I'm asking for your vote on November the 6th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon Carmack. I'm glad you read my website so much. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not calling you a silent cancer. I call the ideas a silent cancer because I think for the last 16 years, um, we have a record that we can run on now and we can say, have you been a leader in education? Have we seen leadership in education? Have we seen leadership in economic reform? Have we seen leadership in tax reform? Have we seen leadership um, in growing our economy, growing our population, in ensuring and telling the nation that we believe that Minnesota is the best state in the United States and that we want you to come here. And moreover, we want you to come to St. Paul. And uh, that's the type of leadership we're going to bring the, to the, not to the White House, um, but to the state capitol. <laughs> and, uh, and I look forward to those discussions. I look forward to the opportunity that's before us now. We have an opportunity to take a fresh perspective at the issues that are facing our district and uh, to make us a leading state in the United States. I think that's an important vision. And you've heard tonight the difference in visions of where we want to take our state. Uh, I want us to be responsible. I want us to be pro-growth. I want us to tell people in the United States that we think our state is the best. And we can't wait to have you here. We can't wait to have your jobs here. We cannot wait to show you that we have the best education program. Uh, we cannot wait to have you raise your families here and include your kids in our great education program. We're very proud of this state. I'm proud of this state. I'm proud to be a Minnesotan. I look forward to getting your vote next Tuesday, and I look forward to bringing some change to uh, St. Paul and providing leadership for a brighter future than we've had uh, recently. Thank you. Thank you. So we've now heard from our two Minnesota House candidates for seat 64B. We'll now start on our candidates for House 64A, and we'll start with Andrew Ojeda. Like I've said continually this whole night, I am proud of the opportunity I have to possibly represent you. I agree wholeheartedly that we can come together, we can solve these great issues that we want. We may not agree on every issue, but we can definitely agree that these are issues that we need to resolve. You know, I, what we heard today is, you know, with, less, with light rail, you know, some people don't survive. And that is, as some businesses don't survive. Some people don't survive. Some families don't survive. Yes, that's, that's a true statement. But do we want it to be the government who decides, or do we want it to be you or your family who decide? I really think that the members of this district, you know, could really benefit with having a not, you know, like an independent voice, somebody who's willing to agree that we need to come together, someone who's willing to step forward and say, you know, let's tackle the tough issues. Somebody who's willing to say, I don't care the political persuasion historically of this district, but we can agree that there's things we can do. I'm really proud of. You know, the great people I've worked alongside with. I'm really proud of the time I had at the Capitol as a legislative intern and meeting the great people on both sides of the aisle and being able to, you know, call a lot of them friends. I'm really proud of the people that I've door knocked with. I'm proud of the people I've talked to. I'm proud of so many great things. I'm proud of this community. I am so fortunate to have to live here and to be able to be, you know, call myself a friend of yours. And I really hope that you know, you can trust me enough to to vote for me on Tuesday and to possibly, or next Tuesday, and to, to call me your next state representative. Thank you very much. Next, our next candidate for House Seat 64A is Erin Murphy. Thank you, and thank you everyone for um, your kindness tonight. I uh, grew up in a family that uh, believed that politics was the way that we shaped our communities. and. With six years into the Minnesota legislature, I still believe that and am optimistic about our capacity to do it. 
uh, in large part because of conversations I continue to have with you. I, um, I love to door knock and I love to uh, visit with the people who live in the district and be I love to do that because it is the preparation I need to represent authentically the people in the district, all our interests, right? Um, in 2010, I worked uh, on a very difficult piece of legislation and we found a solution. I worked with Republican Matt Dean to bring a solution on health care uh, to a, 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 a line item veto that Governor Plenty had executed. And it was a very um, unsatisfactory solution. And you supported me regardless. And that meant a lot to me. And it taught me that we're not uh, doing this work together to find the perfect solution, but to find solutions. And I'm committed to that. The legislature is a place where you need to listen. You need to listen and learn, and then you need to make decisions. And we haven't been making enough decisions for Minnesota. We've been kicking the can down the road. Oh, how I hate that phrase. But that's what we've been doing. I want to go back to the legislature. I want to represent your interests in creating an honest and sustainable budget that sets us toward our future together. I'm going to ask for your vote respectfully. I'd be honored to earn it. And I know that we are mighty together. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you. And now we have our two a candidates for Senate seat 64, and we'll start with Scott Larson. Well, thank everybody for uh, uh, taking the time this evening uh, and coming. Um, uh, the election season is always uh, an interesting time. Uh, the rhetoric that uh, you hear, uh, I'm not going to suggest uh, to anyone that it's not, uh, uh, not honestly spoken and that it's not how people feel. Uh, but I think it's very important that once this rhetoric uh, now goes to practice, uh, we take a look at what the reality of it is. Um, for 26 years, uh, Senator Cohen, I truly believe, has tried. Uh, but what triggered me in moving, uh, 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 Representative Paymar made the statement uh, uh, that G Wiz uh, got elected four years ago, and now they're going to work as hard as they can for four years to uh, see if they can just uh, put up roadblocks and, and destroy the initiative. Um, what caused me to uh, move forward was when Senator Cohen voted in favor of the Viking Stadium. Uh, I took a look at where we are here in St. Paul, and you know, it started out at 423 million to us over here. All of a sudden, it becomes 150 over there. But gee whiz, they get 150 more to fix the Target Center, um, and they don't have to pay for it right away. Um, but we've got 122 acres of Ford plant sitting over there that when it was operating was a million eight in property tax. When they tear it down and put a fence around it, according to Ramsey County, it's four to six hundred thousand. What are we doing about it? You know, it's starting to look like the remake of that old movie Twins. Uh, Minneapolis is Arnold Schwarzenegger and more Danny DeVito. And I just said this is unacceptable. We need to fight for us. We need to come and try and lower our property taxes. We need to work to try and get local government aid equalization for that capital compound. Right now, we pay for that. If we got commercial value there, we would lower our taxes 13% here. Uh, we talk about structural balance. I agree, we need to have LGA control of the city. But, ladies and gentlemen, it gets to a point where we have to make a change at some point. And I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you very much. And finally, Dick Cohen. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I seek uh, re-election because I think I've been an effective legislator for uh, the state of Minnesota, for St. Paul, and particularly for District 64. Uh, Mr. Larson alluded to uh, the Viking Stadium, an issue that I didn't think I would support, but I did so because it was the one opportunity to take care of the debt that has been put on St. Paul through the River Center and through the Hockey Arena. It was done in an unfair way. I was the one legislator uh, in St. Paul who raised questions about those, uh, those projects because I knew the debt that would be placed on St. Paul property taxpayers. It is going up by significant amounts. And there was an opportunity to finally do something about that and to make sure, as uh, Scott suggests, that St. Paul won one at least once. But there were many places where I won for St. Paul, whether it be the Science Museum, the Revenue Building, um, the Ordway, there have been numerous examples. But I do think, in seeking re-election, the issues are bigger than that. I've talked about the budget and what we need to do with the budget. Everybody's talked about a structurally balanced budget. I'm the person who's produced a structurally balanced budget. And I would look at the priorities we've talked about. Rarely have I, uh, during the time I've been in the legislature, not succeeded on my legislative initiatives. 
and I look to the future of what's needed for Minnesota. I talked about early childhood, but expect to author the legislation for early childhood and, and that connection between what happens with somebody in the early years and the impact we have in the early years and what that means for that uh, individual as they get to be older. I've talked about the University of Minnesota and the importance of the University of Minnesota uh, to the state and what it means for the job creation, for the economic growth of Minnesota. I've talked to President Kaler several times about what we need to do for the University of Minnesota. I expect I'll work with President Kaler and be the person who succeeds relative to that. And I want to be the person who works with the tax chairman and the tax committee, both in the Senate and in the House, to make sure we have an LGA program that once again makes the cities a partner with the state and, now, and not the servant of the state. We've seen what's happened with our property taxes. They have doubled in the last 10 years throughout the state. That needs to end. I'll be the person who has the best ability and the knowledge and the ability to work with people across the aisle and in the House of Representatives and with the governor to make sure St. Paul succeeds and the state of Minnesota succeeds. Thank you very much. So I'd like to remind you that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidate and not those of the League of Women Voters, and sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement by the League of any candidate. I would like to again thank the candidates and the live and uh, TV audience. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I would like to acknowledge and thank these candidates who are serving the community by their willingness to participate in the democratic process by running for office. I would also like to thank them for participation in this candidate forum, so thanks. Um, <laughs> information, sorry, information about these candidates and others running in the general election is available on the League of Women Voters website at, at lwvmn.org. And in closing, I'd like to remind you that Tuesday, as if we could forget, November 6th is Election Day, and the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So on November 6th, we hope you take a friend and a neighbor and vote. Thank you, and good night.